Hey everyone, welcome back. Now in the last part of the series, part two, we left off with the Sukulma period of Elam and the rather interesting system of government that they had. You can check out the card or the link below for that. The Sukulma period was followed by another significant era of Elamite history that we call the Middle Elamite period. While scholars haven't really identified a clear break from one period to the other, the Middle Elamite period is generally designated as the four centuries between 1500 and 1100 BCE. This fascinating period of Elamite history is what we'll be discussing in this episode. During the Middle Elamite period, there were three main dynasties that ruled large areas of Elam. They were the Kidinuids, Igihalkids, and the Shutrukids. For the most part, the kings of these dynasties referred to themselves as the king of Anshan and Susa. Akkadian texts referring to Elam during this period basically address such kings in the same way, but in reverse. For example, they use the term king of Susa and Anshan. For them, Susa was the closer and arguably more powerful and dangerous city. Anshan was still quite a ways away. The first dynasty from the Middle Elamite period was that of the Kidinuids, named after their founder, Kidinu. Like many of the kings from this era, we don't have a lot of personal details about Kidinu, only a seal that states, and I quote, Kidinu, king of Susa and Anshan, son of Adad Sharu Rabu, servant of his god, Kirwashir. That particular line is all that we really have about him in terms of information. Four other kings from the Kidinuid dynasty appear on various artifacts. Their names are Inshushinak Sunkir Napipir, Tan Rurihatir, Shala, and Temti Ahar. Again, the lack of information really makes it difficult, if not impossible, to accurately date the reigns of these kings. Even the proper order of these kings, let alone their relationship to each other, is still not known. We just know that Kidinu was the first in the line, and Temti Ahar the last. Temti Ahar, though, is quite notable for several reasons. For one, he's the Kinuyad king for which we have the most inscriptions, documents, and related artifacts for. In fact, his name appears over 50 to 60 times on such objects. One of these objects mentions the phrase, and I quote, the year when the king expelled Kadashman Enlil, Kadashman Enlil is actually a known king from the Kassite dynasty of Babylon. The first of his name, he's believed to have ruled between 1374 to 1360 BCE. Since Temti Ahar was the last Kidinuid king, we can conclude that this dynasty probably ended in the latter half of the 14th century BC. It's also believed by many scholars that Temti Ahar was the founder of the city of Kabrak, Today, the archaeological site known as Haf Tepe. Located in the Iranian province of Khuzestan, close to the Iraqi border, Kabrak is known for its large temple dedicated to the god Kirwashir, beneath which is a funerary complex that scholars think may have been the final resting place for Temti Ahar and his family. Whatever the reason for moving to Kabrak, shortly after Temti Ahar's death, we have a new dynasty claiming to be the kings of Anshan and Susa. These were the Igi Halkids. Based in Susa, these kings are most famous for their grand building projects and stunning artwork. The dynasty was founded by a certain Igi Halki. The exact time, circumstances, and overall way in which he came to power is still uncertain, but there are two main theories. One is that Igi Halki seized power in Susa sometime around the year 1320 BCE. Another, more recent theory, based on various letters that have been recently discovered, state that Igi Halki's successor, Pahir Ishan, was married to the sister or daughter of the Kassite king Kurigalzu I. Kurigalzu's reign, though, ended in 1374 BCE, which means that the foundation of this dynasty was one, much earlier than the 1320 date I just mentioned, and two, overlapped with that of the Kidinuids. If true, then this might be why Temti Ahar moved to Kabrak. Perhaps it was a type of self-imposed exile. Again, and I hate to keep on stressing this, it's hard to know anything here for sure because we don't have much evidence to go on, and that which we do have often leads to dead ends and contradictions. In fact, 
We don't even know for sure how many Iggy Halkid kings there actually were. A decade or so ago, they were believed to have been six or seven. Now, it's at least 10. And the number could increase as new artifacts are found and translated. That being said, let's talk about the most famous Iggy Halkid king, Untash Napirisha. By his building exploits alone, he seems to have been one of the most pious kings in ancient history. Archaeologists have found the remains of numerous massive temples in Susa that were commissioned by him. These were dedicated to Elam's many gods and goddesses. However, his most amazing achievement was the temple complex of Dur Untash, known today as Choga Zandil. Discovered in the 1890s about 40 kilometers southeast of Susa and excavated for several decades afterwards, Dur Untash was a religious city replete with a royal palace, temples, and one of the largest and best preserved ziggurats to ever have been discovered. Around it were smaller temples dedicated to nearly every major deity, not just of Elam, but also of Mesopotamia. This may have been because Untash Napirisha's wife was a Kassite princess named Napir Asu. In fact, arguably the most famous of all Elamite art to ever be uncovered is a now headless bronze statue of her that can be seen in the Louvre. From archive evidence found both in Elam as well as in Babylonia, it can be determined that a good number of Iggy Halkid kings and princes were married to Kassite women. Though at least outwardly pious, Untash Napirisha was a bit boastful as well. There are over 6,000 bricks that have been found with his name inscribed on them, just in case someone was wondering who was responsible for building Dur Untash. New York University archaeologist and professor Daniel T. Potts writes of the site, and I quote, Choga Zanbil is in many ways a remarkable site. With respect to urban development and religious reform, the achievements of Untash Napirisha are unparalleled, even if it is far from certain that Choga Zanbil was an ambitious attempt to replace Susa as the political and religious center of the Elamite kingdom. A kind of federal sanctuary where the gods of the highlands and the lowlands were worshipped on an equal footing. Like their father, Untash Napirisha's sons also married Kassite princesses from Babylon. However, a generation or so after Untash Napirisha's death, the geopolitical situation in the ancient Near East began to change immensely. This was due to growing Assyrian power in northern Mesopotamia. In 1225 BCE, the powerful Assyrian king Dukulti Ninurta I defeated the Kassite king Kashtiliyash IV and conquered Babylonia. He then installed a puppet ruler, Enlil Nadim Shumi, as the new Babylonian king. Though technically a Kassite, he was seen as illegitimate, not only to the Babylonians, but also to the Iggy Halkid kings of Susa and Anshan, who were related by blood and through marriage to Kashtiliyash and his line of Kassite kings. Thus, the Elamites took action. One of the Babylonian chronicles tells us that the Elamite king, Kidin Hutran, attacked parts of eastern Mesopotamia, including the fortress city of Der. He then ventured deep into Kassite Babylonian territory and captured the holy city of Nippur before overthrowing Assyria's Kassite puppet, Enlil Nadim Shumi. This was all in 1224 BCE. However, the details of what ensued and just how much control Kidim Hutran had of the situation are far from clear. This is because, despite overthrowing Enlil Nadim Shumi, who as we mentioned was an Assyrian puppet, Dukulti Ninurta was still able to rule Babylonia through two puppet kings, Kadashman Harbe II and Adad Shuma Idina. What scholars believe probably happened was that the Kassite kingdom broke out into a civil war, with the pro-Assyrian, you could say puppet faction, ruling the northern cities, including the capital of Babylon, and another faction that was loyal to Adad Shumi Usar, who as we mentioned, was the son of the late Kashtaliyash IV. Adad Shuma Usar was also Elam's choice to be king of Babylonia. As powerful as the Assyrians were abroad, domestically, there were problems. Tukulti Ninurta, in part because of his handling of the Babylonian situation, was becoming increasingly unpopular amongst Assyria's political elite. In 1208 BCE, he was assassinated. With the loss of their patron, the government of the pro-Assyrian faction collapsed and their forces were defeated by Adad Shuma Usur, who became the new legitimate king of Kassite Babylonia. 
For reasons that are unknown, sometime during the reign of Adad Shuma Usur, the Igi Halkid dynasty came to an end. The next king that we can historically vouch for as king of Anshan and Susa was Shutruk Nahunte. His impact, as well as that of the dynasty he founded, the Shutrukids, will be discussed in the next segment on Ancient Elam. Once again, thanks so much for joining me. If you learned something, please hit that like button. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Thanks again, and I'll catch you next time.